why don't we go ahead and get started on this, uh, my lovely talk here, uh, so we can um, get to the coffee earlier. Uh, if, you had any, if you're interested in following along on your laptop there, you can download the presentation at SlideShare. Here's the URL. Take a second to copy it if you haven't already. It'll be up here too. Well, thank you, Frank, for uh, an introduction to Recommender Engines on Mahout. Uh, I'm also here to talk about Recommender Engines on Mahout, but I assure you this talk won't really overlap with the last one. It, it covers a, a different aspect of this. Um, I am glad that, uh, thank you, Isabel, for putting these talks together. It's as if you've, you've planned this or something. Um, so uh, I'm Sean. Uh, I work on Mahout. I'm to blame for a lot of the Recommender Engine code in Mahout. So uh, blame to me, please. Um, and I, I think I can actually skip these first two slides as Frank's introduced Mahout and Hadoop. Uh, Mahout is a machine learning library. It's a, the, the concept of Mahout is that it's a, about machine learning and about scale. So not just implementing the algorithms, but implementing them in a way that's friendly to, to large scale. And at the moment, I would say Mahout has four types of things in it, uh, collaborative filtering or recommender engines, clustering, classification, frequent item set mining, there's a couple other things in there too as well that are just now being uh, incubated within the project. But those are, those are the four main ones. And uh, of course, since we're talking about scale, we are really talking about Hadoop. So uh, a lot of what Mahout has to say about uh, scalable implementations means uh, implementing stuff on Hadoop. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today, how you can do recommendations on Hadoop. We're gonna move away from the nice friendly world of uh, one machine, maybe less than about 100 million data points into the world of uh, billions of data points when you really need uh, more than one machine. And simple things get complicated when you move from uh, one JVM to a whole distributed cluster, and we'll see that firsthand. Uh, I think we all know what collaborative filtering is, but just to define it, it's, it's, uh, it's recommender engines. Uh, if you've gone to Amazon and seen the recommendations, that's really uh, collaborative filtering. But very specifically, collaborative filtering means recommending items based only on what you know about associations between users and items. Uh, it doesn't really require any knowledge of who the users are, like where they live or where their gender. It doesn't really require knowledge of the items either. Uh, you could recommend not just items to users, but users to items or users to users or uh, vacation destinations to pets. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. You're, as long as you have input about how users, whatever they are, are associated to items, you can run these algorithms. So in that sense, they're nice. They, they, they can apply to a lot of things. So that's what we're talking about today at scale. Uh, the collaborative filtering problem is pretty simple. You take your information, which is of, of the form A has some feeling about or association to B, and you convert them into tuples, uh, user item preference value. So if I, if I like the movie Scarface a lot, and I'm user 123, and Scarface is item 654, and I rated a five-star movie, that might be the tuple 123654. Five, and likewise for everything else. And so all these algorithms are just crunching all these tuples together, doing some magic, and outputting new tuples or recommendations. So we might come out of this uh, algorithm, decide that Grant, user 3545, should be recommended the movie Scarface because we think his preference for it will be 4.5. So this is, this is collaborative filtering in a nutshell. This is, this is all it is, tuples to tuples. Uh, now today, to motivate in an example, I want to talk about uh, users as pets and items as, as people food. Uh, I don't know if you have a pet, but I think if you have a dog, you know that they love to run up and eat people food, eat food they're not supposed to, hamburgers and hot dogs and such. So, so based on some of these observed behaviors, I'm, I want to figure out what else this guy might like to eat that he hasn't already eaten. So let's, let's set up a simple example. Uh, let's say we know that we've seen the dog eat hamburgers and hot dogs and loved them. We've seen him eat blueberries as well, but he didn't seem to like them nearly as much. And we haven't seen him eat these other, other foods here, and I'm, I'm wondering what he might go after next. Well, one way to uh, approach this problem might be to say, well, s I figure that ice cream is similar to hot dogs and hamburgers. I mean, it's a fatty junk food. So since he likes these hot dogs and hamburgers, I figure he'll also like ice cream. Simple as that. Um, even though I've seen him eat blueberries, and I know strawberries are similar to blueberries, I know he didn't like the blueberries very much. So maybe strawberries aren't the best recommendation. And all these other things like coffee and wine, probably not his, his cup of tea. 
So this is the essence of the item-based algorithm. That's all there is to it. You're just looking at what is similar to things the user, the dog, already likes. That's it. But this very simple idea, which is one that, uh, one that Frank uh, mentioned as one of the many uh, uh, online, simple, non-distributed versions that are available in the house. This is one that's been implemented in a distributed form, and we're going to talk about that today. And you'll see how such a simple algorithm can actually get pretty complicated when you deal with large scale and stick it on Hadoop. So if you want to formalize this, this is the item-based algorithm. For every item that the user has no preference for yet, so for every thing he hasn't eaten yet, ice cream, strawberries, cantaloupe, wine, coffee, take any one of them, like ice cream. And for every item that uh, the dog does already have a preference for, meaning mm, hot dogs, hamburgers, and uh, blueberries, figure out some notion of similarity between those two things and use those as a weight in some kind of weighted average to figure out the estimated preference for item, item I, in this case, the ice cream. You do that, you compute all these weighted averages, and just simply take the uh, items that have the highest estimated preference as your recommendations. That's it. That's really all there is to it. This is as complicated as I could make it in pseudocode. Now, I say it's simple, but there's one piece here that's maybe not so simple or I've glossed over, and it's this idea of similarity. We, don't, we haven't really defined what similar means. And I'd, we could define similarity based on the content of the food. Uh, we, I, I said earlier that, well, ice cream is kind of fatty like hamburgers. That would be an example of content-based recommendations, not collaborative filtering, since that's actually using something about the items themselves to determine similarity. We're not going to do that. We're going to do something even dumber. Uh, we're going to use strictly collaborative filtering techniques. We're going to define similarity purely based on preferences, uh, pets' preferences for food. And in fact, we're not even going to use some of the fancy algorithms that are in the framework in a non-distributed form, like uh, uh, Pearson correlation, Tanimoto log likelihood. We're going to use something called simple co-occurrence. So we're going to say two items are similar when they appear often in the same pet set of eaten foods. So for example, if I uh, see that a lot of pets eat both strawberries and blueberries, I figure they're similar items, simply because those show up a lot together. They co-occur many times. It's a very simple idea. And we're going to go with that for purposes of this example. That is our definition of similarity. When that number is high, items are similar. So let's run a quick example just to illustrate. Uh, let's say we are estimating how much the dog's going to like ice cream. Uh, we put some numbers on this. So we figure he likes hamburgers and hot dogs. He rates them a five, let's say. Uh, he doesn't like blueberries that much. He rates them a two. And we don't know about everything else. We haven't seen him eat them and react. Uh, and let's say we know from our other pet data that uh, Hamburgers and ice cream co-occur nine times, hot dogs 16 times, blueberries five times. So this is some notion of similarity between these foods that makes some sense. So to compute some uh, estimated similarity for ice cream, we do a simple weighted average um, uh, of these values weighted by those weights. Uh, five times nine plus five times 16 plus two times five divided by the sum of the weights gives us 4.5. This is the recommender algorithm, the, the item-based recommender algorithm. And it's quite simple, using co-occurrence as a similarity function. So this is where the simplicity starts to, starts to go away. I'm gonna, I would like to make this a bit more complicated and start throwing you some curveballs. So first, I'd like to, you to think of this computation in terms of matrices and vectors. That's the first step towards uh, getting this onto a dupe. So instead of thinking of these as just numbers in, in terms of this sh short algorithm, let's think of um, the dog as having a vector of preferences. Each dimension corresponds to a food. So there's an ice cream dimension, and a hamburger dimension, and a hot dog dimension. And the value along that dimension for his vector is simply his preference value. Um, and uh, let's also imagine that co-occurrences, all these co-occurrences between every pair of foods are in a big matrix. Uh, so there's, again, one dimension for every item uh, along the rows and columns. And the entry in the ith column and jth row is simply the number of times food i and food j co-occur. Okay? It's like a similarity matrix. Uh, if we think of it that way, the computation looks something like this. So I haven't listed all the foods here. I've just uh, gone with five. So here we have that preference vector for the dog. Um, you can see his rating for five uh, for hamburgers and hot dogs and, and the, their dimensions. He's implicitly got a zero rating for things he hasn't seen before uh, in his vector. And this vector is larger and potentially very, very large, very sparse as well, many zeros. But that's, that's how we're going to think of his preferences. And likewise, we're going to think of co-occurrences as a big matrix. 
So here, uh, again, there's the 9, 16, and 5. Co-occurrence is between ice cream and the three foods. Uh, this matrix is obviously symmetric, and they made up some other decent values. So I claim that this is the whole of the item-based algorithm. If you do this product, this matrix times vector, look at the resulting vector and pick the foods with the highest number, that's the same thing. It's the same algorithm we've been looking at before. Almost, but let, let me just draw the, draw the parallel here. So remember that uh, to compute that top value in the result, I have to multiply the vector by the top row in the matrix. It's just the pairwise product. 16 times 0, 9 times 5, 16 times 5, 5 times 2, 6 times 0. That's actually the computation we just did before in the numerator here. Now, the 0 terms didn't appear here, but uh, obviously they make no difference to the sum. Here we, uh, we actually normalized, we divided by the sum of the weights. We're not going to do that um, for purposes of creating the recommendation vector. You could, and you probably should, but to keep it simple, we're not. So I claim that for the same reason uh, before, that was a good way of producing estimated preferences, that the similar computation expressed as a series of matrix times vector operations is another good way to do the same thing, to come up with some kind of estimated preference value or some number that's higher for better recommendations. So let's say you accept, let's say you go back and think about this for a minute and accept that this is basically a valid interpretation of the previous algorithm as one big matrix and vector operation. The question is, how do we do this efficiently? Now, I think you can see the problem here. We have five foods here, but if I had 10 million, this matrix potentially has, what, 100 quadrillion entries. It's way too big to fit into memory. We can't possibly do this computation by simply loading a matrix and a vector into memory and doing the, co the simple computation. Now, if you're, if you're clever out there, you're probably thinking, you know where I'm going with this, that you can distribute this operation, right? After all, computing the top element there, that 135, has nothing to do with computing the 251, 220, 60, and so on. And uh, incidentally, those numbers are grayed out because they're not valid recommendations. These are items that the dog already has some preference for. So we would never recommend hot dogs to the dog. He already knows how he feels about hot dogs. He likes them. Um, so yes, you could do it. You could One, one uh, step towards distributing this algorithm could be to say, this is the whole algorithm, and I'm going to distribute this matrix, matrix multiplication by simply computing each element of the result separately. The problem is that's not good enough. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you how it, uh, a better way to do it, but I don't even want people to get hung up on the details. I'm just trying to give a sense or a flavor of uh, how the thinking has to be different at large scale to do this in any kind of uh, reasonable time frame. And later, we'll actually see how it's implemented in, in Hadoop as well. Um, so the problem with the naive or normal way of matrix multiplication is you still have to touch the entire matrix. To do this product, even in a, a distributed way, you still have to multiply every single row by this vector. And again, if your uh, preference, if your, sorry, co-occurrence matrix is large, this is still going to take forever. Even if you throw a thousand machines at it, it's still going to take an amazing amount of computation. The way this, this ends up being a very inefficient way of doing this matrix multiplication in this case because, actually, the preference vector is very sparse. When I say sparse, I mean it has a lot of zeros. Out of all possible foods in the universe, the dog's only probably eaten a couple of them. So if we actually drew out this vector for all foods, it would have a ton of zeros. Zeros, uh, and so computing somehow this uh, matrix product is, is inefficient. We can take advantage of the fact that that, matri that vector is actually very sparse by turning the matrix multiplication inside out. So forget for a second the normal way of multiplying matrices, and let me introduce an, a different way of multiplying matrices. Instead of doing this um, dot product of every row with the, the column vector to produce the result, instead think about multiplying each element of that preference vector, each scalar, by one column of the matrix and adding those up to form the result. This is what I mean. I'll go back to the other, other uh, matrix diagram in a second to maybe give the intuition about why this is valid. But I claim that instead of uh, what I did before, I could easily have taken the dog's preference for hamburgers, five, times the column of co-occurrences or similarities for hamburgers, added that similarity to his preference times the hot dog column, his preference for blueberries times the blueberry column, add those up and get the same result. I do. As a matter of fact, it is valid. And um, it might be a little clearer if you stare at this for a minute and just think about how the, how the multiplication, how, how the, these numbers come about. 
Um, stare at it. Think about it later. It's, it's not important to, to get it right now, but that is a, a valid way of defining matrix multiplication as well. The nice thing there, of course, is that uh, this computation only involves a multiplication for every non-zero item in that dog's preference vector. I can ignore completely anything he's never seen before. So rather than touching all columns of this co-occurrence matrix, I'll only touch a, a number equal to the number of uh, uh, foods for which the dog expresses a preference. It might be 10 instead of 10 million. Much, much, much better. So the not naive matrix multiplication would have worked. This happens to work a whole lot faster. And that's one of the things that's different when you get to scale. You can't just apply necessarily the standard way of doing things. So this is how it is done in Mahout uh, for this recommender system and in a, a couple other cases. Just a taste. So now, as promised, let me get on to MapReduce and how this relates to uh, MapReduce. So uh, I think we all know in this room roughly what MapReduce is. It's um, uh, a programming paradigm. It's a way of structuring computations. And it's, uh, it sounds weird at first. Um, a MapReduce uh, process takes as input a series of key value pairs, does some computation, produces uh, another set of key value pairs where each key may uh, be uh, associated to multiple values. The system collects all that and pulls together all values for one key, feeds all those into uh, something called a reducer, a second stage, which then produces a third set of key value pairs. And that's it. And it turns out that stringing together computations structured like this uh, lets you get some useful work done if you, if you think about it hard enough. And more importantly, structuring computations this way makes them very, very parallelizable. And this is really what Hadoop does. It implements MapReduce. It lets you run computations structured like this in a very efficient distributed way. So the challenge is to take this um, matrix multiplication problem we've described and implement it in terms of MapReduce. Conceptually, it's pretty easy. But when you get down to brass tacks and uh, implement this on as a series of MapReduces, it gets a little more complicated. And I'll explain how it works at a high level, not in detail, no code, uh, because I really just want to give a taste of how this feels and how it looks. Uh, you're welcome to obviously look at the code later, which is a fair bit more complex. But here's, here's how it goes. Here's how it goes, roughly. Uh, step one, build the user vectors. So we have as input tuples, user item preference. What we really want as output is a user mapped to uh, a large vector where items, uh, the dimensions are items and preference, uh, the values are preference values. It's pretty easy. Uh, if I take as input these uh, tuples, I can simply output as key user and as uh, value an item preference pair. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in the reducer, I've, uh, the framework automatically collects all those item preference pairs for each user. And from that, I can put together a, a vector, one whole data structure that has all preferences from one user. Voila, I have my user vectors, which is one key component that we've been using. That's stage one. Stage two, we count co-occurrence. We construct that big matrix we saw. Co-occurrence is pretty easy once you have the user vectors, because once I have for every user every item that they have some association to, I can simply look, uh, output for each item every other item in that user's list of items, and then go count those up later. So that's exactly what this does. Stage one, mapper takes us and put the user vectors. And for every user outputs, uh, all item item pairs it sees in that list. The reducer gets, for each item, a whole bunch of other item IDs. So it might get hamburger mapped to ice cream, ice cream, ice cream, hot dog, hot dog. And in that case, it would figure that uh, hamburger and ice cream co-occur three times, hamburger and hot dog co-occur twice. Those counts together form the columns of the matrix. So really, I'm going to output uh, item ID mapped to a, a vector, which is like a column of this matrix. That's my output. Taken together, that is the co-occurrence matrix. <coughs> Stage three. This one's tricky. It has two mappers, because we actually want to combine two different kinds of data. We want to combine both those columns and also all the user preferences for items, for each of those items. So, so one of the mappers is going to take the user vectors again and output instead item mapped to user and preference value. So for every item, it's going to output that user preference pair. The other mapper is going to simply output the columns of the co-occurrence matrix, keyed by item. So we have two different things keyed by item, and the framework's going to bring them together for us. So what this is setting us up for is this stage. 
So what I've just described is collecting the fives, these fives, fives, and twos, these coefficients, and the columns. We want to output those so we can collect them together by item. So here what I've done is actually computed this product for every item that one user has a preference for. What we're actually going to do is compute um, this little product for all, uh, for all the hamburger pairs, all the, all the users that like hamburgers. So I'll put all these in one, in one go. And then likewise for the hot dogs and so on, and then add them up later. So we're not going to do it by user, but rather do these products by item, and then do the sum later. So that's what's going on in phase three. We collect this information with two mappers. And actually, the reducer in this phase doesn't do anything for technical reasons. It just passes them through. And this, these two bits of data are then used in a final fourth phase. So we have, by item, we have a column vector, which is the column of the co-occurrence matrix. And we have all these user and uh, preference pairs. We do the multiplication. And the result is a vector that's part of the partial, a partial sum for that user's recommendation vector. So we output it keyed by user. The reducer collects those together. Again, they're keyed by user, adds them together, and that's the final recommendation vector. And from there, it's simple to compute recommendations. So step four is doing this sum to get that final vector. From there, it simply computes the recommendations, and that's it. Now, the details aren't necessarily terribly important or interesting right now. You're welcome to go look at the source code, but that's roughly what it, what it feels like to implement a fairly simple algorithm on a, in, in a distributed way. So one key feature I think you'll notice is that no stage of this algorithm does or can touch the entire matrix. It's not available on any one machine. So you can never write a step of this algorithm that does anything with the entire matrix. It's even difficult in some cases to deal with the whole column of the co-occurrence matrix, but we allow ourselves that. So I guess uh, one observation is that this this, I think, I hope you'll agree, seems a whole lot more complicated than that one slide we saw earlier where we explained the item-based algorithm and decided this was just too easy. And that's really the, that's really the story with uh, scale and Hadoop. It's not simple to restructure these conceptually simple algorithms in a fully distributed way. Um, this is an actual flow diagram for the full proper recommender algorithm as implemented in Mahout. I've even omitted a couple steps here. There's a couple more op optimizations in here. For example, for Hadoop junkies, there's combiners involved for speed and such. So it looks a bit more like that. Um, if you're interested, this is ready to go. You can try and run this right now. Uh, if Go to mahout.apache.org, download the latest from Subversion. Uh, all of the, everything I've mentioned here is not available in the last release, 0.3. It's going to be released in 0.4. So you have to go to Subversion to get, uh, get what I've mentioned here. And it's actually quite simple. Set up a Hadoop cluster if you don't have one running already. Throw some input data as a simple text file in HDFS. And that's all you need to do. It's as uh, simple as that to kick off a, a Hadoop job that runs through a bunch of data and produces recommendations. Uh, to give you some sense of how fast or slow it runs, uh, I ran uh, a data set that has about 130 million associations. Um, this is a data set drawn from Wikipedia. It has uh, its links from about 5.7 million articles to other articles. So uh, effectively, I was trying to recommend articles that weren't linked from an article, but maybe should have been to another article. So again, users and items can be funny things. Uh, so to run 100 uh, recommendations for these 5.7 million users on a data set of this size took about 700 hours of CPU time. So 700 hours on one machine, sure, but an hour on 700 machines, eh, ideally. Um, that's not bad. That works out to about uh, four-tenths of a second per user recommendation. It's not, not speedy, but it's really not bad when you think about the overhead. So, so these algorithms are uh, reasonably fast. They're, they're, not, they're not terrible, but they can be better. Um, small plug, yes, there is a, a book on this if you're interested in reading up in a, in a bit more detail on this. Uh, there's a early access available to Mount in Action, which is still being written. Uh, the recommender section is done. Uh, the clustering section is being released right now, and classification is still coming. So if you're really, really interested to read more now, you can check this out from Manning. And uh, that is about it from me. Um, I will say that I, I have to run right after this uh, presentation. So if you, if you want to talk more about this, we can certainly catch up on the user list, uh, user at uh, apache, mathout.apache.org, or you can contact me at Gmail if you really want to. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. And for now, I'd be happy to take any, any questions, comments on, on um, distributed recommenders. Thoughts, comments? 
Question, sir? The distributed version? No, this has really just be, uh, become production ready, I'd say, in the last, I mean, literally a couple of weeks. So no, I've not personally run this in production myself. I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, to the point you could certainly try it. I, I think it's pretty reliable. Question there? To-do list, yeah, good question. So uh, in comparison with the non-distributed part of Mahout, the recommenders, this is pretty, uh, pretty underdeveloped. There's basically one algorithm on offer versus about 10 on the, in the non-distributed form. But I think the next, uh, next stop is uh, SVD-based algorithms. So these are algorithms that use the singular value decomposition to uh, crunch down that big co-occurrence matrix really into something more manageable and does some transformations to speed that computation by crunching that matrix down into something that approximates it but is much smaller. So that's something that students working on this summer as part of the Google Summer of Code project. So I would say that's the next stop. Was there a question farther back? Second set? Same question, okay, thank you. Right, so the, you don't have to put the whole matrix in memory because you, you can't really. That, that's what phase two is about. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd repeat the question, thank you. Um, so the question is, uh, how can you construct this large co-occurrence matrix? It won't fit in, it won't fit in memory. How, how do you, can you use Hadoop to, to solve that problem? I would, I would point to step two. That's really what this map reduce phase is doing. So at no point is the whole matrix in memory because it can't fit in memory. So here you can at least uh, use Hadoop to process each user vector individually and output its co-occurrences, its partial co-occurrence sums, and then use Hadoop to add those up and output them to disk with, while never having it all in memory. Question down front? Why don't you implement the uh, So why, why don't you implement the Netflix solution? Uh, that is in theory what the student's working on this summer. So their solution was a, well, it was a lot of things, but it involved a, a singular value decomposition and adding some notion of the, the, the timestamp, right? They call it the SVD++ algorithm. Uh, why do you waste your time with this stuff? Well, this is, this is, is fast and it's simple. Um, I'm not sure that the SVD++ algorithm is, is generally applicable. For example, they're using timestamp information. You don't necessarily have that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a complicated and, and, and nice algorithm, I'm sure, that they implemented. And that's one of the next stops on the, on the to-do list for the project, no doubt. Questions or comments? Others? You, sir? Yeah, that's fine. The question is, could you recommend people to people? That's one question. And I guess the other part of this question is, can you recommend when you don't have preference values, when you just have a, a, an association? Uh, yes, users and items can be anything. Uh, they could be users and users. So if you have associations between users and users, you can use this as input as well. Just think of your users as both users and items. And uh, also, yes, you can use, uh, it, for example, in this situation, we almost didn't use preference values. They could have, uh, if, we didn't, if we just had raw associations, we could have thought of them as uh, ones and zeros instead, and that would have worked out. And in the non-distributed version, there's uh, significant support for uh, what I call Boolean preferences. If they're either there or they aren't. There's no rating value. So yes. Was there one more question here? Yes, you, sir. Uh, is this what Amazon's doing with their books? Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember reading an early paper from Amazon that suggested they do item-based collaborative filtering, which makes sense, uh, mostly because item-item uh, -item similarities tend to be stable and pre-computable. So you can, for example, do stage two here and save the result. And you don't have to recompute it that often if you don't want to. Um, so I think they do something like item-based algorithms. Um, 
with I'm sure a bunch of heuristics and tweaks and other other stuff. Uh, I think a lot of what they the value they add is in inferring your preference. So you can explicitly rate an item, but they also take into account the fact that you browsed an item or you bought an item, and they have to map that onto some preference function. And doing that well contributes a lot to the quality of recommendations. Beyond that, I actually don't know a lot about what they do. Uh, so th uh, one more question. Thank you. Can you use this to recommend an item to someone with no previous preferences? So with no information, no. I mean, if you don't know anything about the user, anything about what they like, no. And the standard answer there is to uh, cheat and maybe recommend a, a, a canned set of uh, recommendations to them. You don't want to give them nothing in a production system. Uh, I think people also might, in that case, try to use a content, meaning the attributes of the user, may they know that they're from a certain geography or whatever to take an educated guess, which isn't strictly collaborative filtering. So I think that would be the, the general answer, but, but, but no. And, and strictly speaking, in collaborative filtering, you, you couldn't produce an answer. Well, thank you very much. I know the day is wearing on, so I want to uh, call, it, call it a day there. Uh, I will be outside if anyone uh, wants to chat offline for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, then I have to run off. But thank you very much for having me, and I hope you check out Mahout later. Thank you.